Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk a little bit about surveying birds, uh, and particularly field techniques used to count them uh, when we're out conducting research and, and bird studies. So we're going to cover a couple of main types of bird surveys that are commonly used, uh, including what's called a point count survey, a line or strip transect, uh, and then we'll also talk about counting birds from shore, so if we're looking at seabirds or birds on a lake. There are a number of reasons why researchers might want to count birds. Uh, for example, we might ask questions about where birds occur uh, and if they're occurring in a particular area. This will document the range of the species. It might give us kind of rough, rough estimates of how common or rare they are. It can also be used to help us understand diversity. Uh, we may also want a little more specific information about the individual populations of birds. So we might ask how many birds of a given species are there, uh, what densities are they within uh, comparing different areas or across time. Um, we may also want to document habitat associations. So by linking bird populations to habitat features, we understand uh, some of their demographic patterns and resource use. That also helps us kind of understand how bird populations might uh, be affected by different land management and conservation efforts. So we often want to know how many birds there are. Uh, but when we say we're seeking to know how many, uh, there's a couple of different ways that we can kind of understand how many, right? There's different ways we can think about and measure abundance. Probably the most basic definition, the one that most people think about when you say how many there are, is really thinking about, you know, how many individuals are there? Can we count all of the individuals? That's a metric that we call total abundance. Uh, and while most researchers would love to know that, uh, it's actually really difficult to actually get. So, so more ornithologists and ecologists don't ever really get total abundance uh, because that's only really feasible for you know organisms that are you know not super abundant in the environment, are easy to identify and count, right? They're not hidden in the environment, and B occur in fairly limited areas that we actually can feasibly survey the entirety of. Um, because that doesn't apply to most organisms, uh, and certainly not to most birds, uh, that's a lofty goal, but not one we can usually attain. So rather, what most ornithologists and ecologists aspire to is a value we call density. Density, in this case, is the number per some standard unit of uh, area, right? So how many birds are there per hectare, or per square kilometer, or even per square meter? Now that's really handy because if we have that, right, or at least an estimate of density, then we can estimate total abundance for a given area. Uh, so it's, it's very handy for us to estimate total abundance. Uh, the trick is, is to get the density values. That does mean we need very good counts of birds over a known area, right? We have to know how many uh, birds rep are represented within kind of a more given area. But with repeated sampling, this is doable, uh, and this is what most studies aspire to, is to have actual density measurements. Not of all our questions, though, require us to actually know the number per unit area. A lot of our questions are comparative in nature. You know, are there more here versus there, or are the numbers changing through time? Um, and in most cases, as long as you measure your, you know, birds in a very consistent way, we can still use those numbers as what we would call a measure of relative abundance, even if we can't use that to estimate density. So if we just go out and, you know, cover a fixed area, you know, over a common amount of time, uh, and we measure consistently across multiple uh, places or across different samples, if we count more in one place than another, we may not know if that's representative of the total number that are there or have the ability to estimate density, but we can probably say with some confidence, okay, we counted more there, so there are probably more there, right? Um, so that's what we call the relative abundance. And that's particularly useful if you're monitoring populations through time and understanding if they're increasing or decreasing, right? So if, if numbers are getting bigger or smaller, we can use metrics of relative abundance to look at uh, trends in population size. Finally, we can link these numbers to the habitat, right, to the locations they are, and look at patterns of abundance uh, across space, and that's what we would call the distribution. Now, I alluded to this when I talked about kind of these measurements of relative abundance, but anytime we're conducting any sort of survey, it's really important for us to kind of think about how we're going to standardize 
our effort? How are we going to standardize the way that we're sampling and counting birds across all of our samples and all of our surveys? Um, and these are just some of the, the common elements that, that you really need to think about anytime you're out there uh, conducting any sort of survey. Um, the first is obviously if you're you know, going to do a count, you're going to, especially if you're calculating density or relative abundance, you know, if I go and search you know, my small backyard and compare that to, you know, a large national park, clearly there's going to be more birds in the bigger area, right? Um, so if you want to make an apples to apples comparison, you need to standardize and make sure that your survey areas uh, are equal across all your samples. Similarly, the amount of time you spent looking is going to impact how many birds you get. So similarly, you always want to standardize the amount of time that you're actually counting and conducting your survey. Uh, and these are probably the two biggest things that you know, you'll, you'll always want to make sure you're doing in a standardized way, is have a standard survey area and a standard amount of time spent surveying. There's a few other things that are also important to consider. Uh, the number of observers is pretty important. You know, a group of 10 people will probably find more birds than you know, a group of two or three people. So again, if you know, you're actually surveying in groups, you want to make sure the number of observers is accounted for. Um, and then the skill of the observers can also be really important. Uh, you know, someone who's really trained is going to find more birds and be able to more easily identify them than someone who's less trained. Um, and so in this case, you can't always assure that all your observers have the same skill. Um, so if that's not possible, that means you're employing some sort of randomization so that you're not systematically biasing your results. Or in some cases, have, you know, the same observer or a few set of well-trained observers uh, conducting all of your samples. Uh, and then finally, related to kind of the analysis and statistics, you also want to make sure that you have, you know, balanced number of surveys, especially if you're doing comparisons, say, between sites or over time. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the different count and census methods. We'll start talking about point counts, uh, kind of dig into point counts uh, a little bit. We'll then introduce line transects, area searches, and coastal surveys. If we want to measure bird abundance in a given area, one technique we can use is the point count. Uh, and the idea behind a point count is that you as the observer are going to basically remain stationary in one place and count all the birds that you can detect around you. So for the typical point count, you first need to identify your point. Uh, and typically you're going to stand there uh, quietly uh, and listen and observe you know, what's going on around you. Now, point counts uh, come in a couple of different flavors, uh, and probably the most common one is in order to get a density, we need to know the area that we're surveying. Uh, so probably the more common type of point count is what's called a fixed radius point count. So in this case, there's going to be a given distance over which you'll record your observations, uh, and that gives you a circle of known area that you're surveying. So to conduct the point counts and do these uh, in a systematic standardized way, you'd then have a fixed radius. Uh, you wouldn't count anything beyond that radius. Uh, and then, of course, you'd have a standardized survey time uh, over which you'd count the birds. An alternate type of point count, though, is what we call a variable radius uh, point count. In this case, you can count any bird that you detect. Uh, so if you see or hear it, you can count it. Uh, but now you need to estimate the distance to that bird. Uh, and the reason you want to do that is because then you can still use that to, de to determine your densities using some fairly elaborate calculations that take into account how easily detectable the bird is, right? The idea being that large or very prominent birds, you know, if they're singing or, or uh, you know, making a lot of motion, you might be able to detect from farther away than quieter, more secretive birds that would be detected over a smaller radius. Um, similarly, with the kind of uh, other types of point counts, you'd still want a standard survey time. Now, obviously, you know, if you're 
trying to measure bird abundance in, in a larger area. A single point, a single sample is really not uh, going to give you enough information. What you need is you need many points uh, that you can then average or compare. So typically if you're surveying a larger area, you're going to have a number of different points that you're surveying, uh, and then that's going to give you a better estimate for bird abundance and diversity within that larger area. The trick is that you have to now space these points out, right? Uh, if you have them too close together, that's going to be a problem because you might hear or see the same birds and recount them, uh, and that definitely introduces error into your surveys. Um, the trick, though, is if they're too far apart, then they're going to be harder for you to get from one to the other. And ideally, you want to be able to move from one point to the next fairly efficiently uh, so that you're not affecting your surveys you know, by doing one early in the morning and one late in the evening because it takes that long to get from point to point. So you want to have you know, some distance between them, uh, but not too much. Um, and kind of the minimum uh, is probably about 150 meters between points. Uh, that's the point where you start decreasing the likelihood of counting the same bird over and over again. Uh, and for fixed radius surveys, that's usually plenty. Um, for variable radius surveys, though, where you might actually be seeing pretty far off birds and counting them, you want to up this considerably. Uh, and most researchers, if they can get through the habitat easily, would much prefer distances, uh, you know, on the order of 250 or 300 meters apart. That does mean that this takes a fair bit of planning to make sure you know where your points are. Um, so again, you know, there's lots of variables that you want to fix here, but the trick is, is you want a standardized survey. Uh, so typically beforehand, you're going to figure out where those points are uh, and move them along some kind of transect, right? So here, for example, we have a transect line, and basically we want to have points spread out along that transect line. Uh, in this case, each of these circles represents the radius you're surveying around these different sample points. Um, and of course, you want these standardized so that you're measuring uh, a given range, right? So here these circles are 100 meters in diameter. That would be equivalent to a 50 meter fixed radius point count. Uh, and then we want to make sure, given the radius we're using, that they're not going to overlap, right? So in this case, we've spaced them 150 meters apart. That way there's a gap between them, uh, and we're less likely then to double count birds as we move along this transect uh, and count these different points. The other thing, of course, we need to make sure that we're standardizing is our survey time. So, for example, we could choose uh, a five-minute count at each point. Uh, usually, point counts range from probably about three to ten minutes, but five-minute and ten-minute intervals are pretty common for point count surveys. Now, this does, however, require that we measure in the field how far we're moving between these points. So if you need to estimate the distance that you're traveling, one way to do so is through pacing. But first you have to do a little bit of calibration. So one meter is about three feet, uh, three inches, so a little over a yard. Um, so what we want to do is measure our stride length. So one pace is basically one step followed by another, left foot, right foot. Uh, and with a bit of practice, you can actually get your pacing, right, your steps, to measure out approximately one meter. Um, so it takes a little bit of practice. Uh, another way you can do this is by setting up uh, markers along the trail, counting out the number of paces or steps that you do, uh, and set another marker uh, a given distance, uh, you should then measure how far you've traveled. Right? So you can take a tape measure, uh, see how long it took you to get from point A to point B in so many steps or so many paces. Once you've got that calibrated, then you want to practice this over and over uh, to make sure that you've got uh, your stride length set to actually recreate that distance traveled. If you don't have a tape measure, you can still practice your pacing at home and calibrate your pacing uh, by using some items that have standard sizes. Uh, for example, mattresses um, usually vary in between 75 and 80 inches in length from head to foot, uh, and that's about 2 meters, so 2 meters is about 78.7 inches. 
Um, so kind of head to foot, your mattress is about two paces. Uh, you can also look down on the floor. Floor tiles come in standard sizes. Uh, you might have to know which size your, your floor uses. Um, but for example, 12 by 12 is pretty common. Um, and so there, you know, one meter, one pace would be about 3.28 tiles. Um, so again, you can use these benchmarks to help you calibrate your pacing. Once you have your steps calibrated, you can then pretty much just measure a distance by counting your steps or counting the paces in the field. Uh, and this is an effective way to measure how far apart different points are uh, out in the field. Now that works really well along trails or in straight lines. Uh, if you're in rougher territory and you have to avoid obstacles, you do want to keep that in mind. So you might have to sidestep, for example, to get around obstacles uh, and then keep counting. Uh, so the trick is to remember you're trying to measure straight line distances. So once you've found the location for your study site and you paste it out and found it through some other means, uh, now you want to pause before you actually start your survey. Uh, you may have disturbed some of the birds as you've moved through the habitat, so you want them to get used to your presence. Uh, you also can use this time to start to look around and listen and determine what's in the immediate area so that once you start your survey, you already kind of know what the identification of some of the species will be seen. One of the most important things that you need to be doing when you're out doing a bird survey is to listen very carefully. Uh, most of the time you'll hear the bird before you actually see them, um, so that'll help you figure out where you should be looking to identify them. Uh, in many cases, you can also start to identify birds even before you've seen them. So for example, in the past few minutes, I've heard a red-shouldered hawk off in the distance. Uh, I'm hearing some juncos calling and some purple finches calling as well. Uh, and a few minutes ago, I heard some acorn woodpeckers in the distance. So without even seeing them, I already know what I should be looking for. There was a Pacific Slope flycatcher just calling right there. Uh, and again, we can get a lot of our bird observations, uh, in many cases done or confirmed by using our ears. You also want to always be looking around. Uh, many times birds will fly overhead, so particularly if you have an open expanse of sky, it's good to be scanning that while you're uh, looking around and listening. When you're finally ready to begin doing your point count survey, you definitely you want to make sure you do a few things before. Uh, the first is make sure you check your time uh, and have a timing device ready so that you can monitor how long you've been surveying. You also want to make sure you have whatever device you're using to record your data ready to go. So if you have data sheets, have those ready. If you're recording this on an app, have the app prepped. Uh, and spend a few minutes to record what we call metadata. So these are things like the time of the survey, the date of the survey. Some surveys require you to enter weather uh, and other information about the survey. Once all of that is squared away and you have your data entered, now you can officially start your survey uh, and, of course, start looking around. As you detect birds, you'll definitely want to try to identify them if possible. Uh, so if you can do that by their sound, great. Um, otherwise, you can't really move too far off the point, uh, but if you can see them, you can use your binoculars to try to get a positive identification. Once you've identified the bird, here we see a bush tit, uh, then we can record that using our data recording device. It's important that you monitor the time while you're conducting your surveys and even while you're checking uh, your time or you're recording on your device, you still want to be listening and looking around for other birds that might enter your survey area.
once you've completed your survey, you can finish up recording any metadata that you need. Otherwise, you can proceed to your next point. Well, point counts are very commonly used to survey birds. They do have their limitations, and one of those is that you're tied to one spot. Uh, so that can make it difficult sometimes to see and identify birds. It also makes it harder to really cover a broad swath of the habitat that you're interested in. So an alternate survey method, which is really an adaptation of the point count, is a walking transect. And again, there's a couple of different flavors of walking transect. By far the most common is what's oftentimes referred to as a line or stripped tra strip transect. Uh, and for a line transect, the basic idea is now you're walking along the transect. So the observer is going to slowly walk in the direction of the transect. Uh, and the key here is you want to walk slowly, but fairly consistently. You're trying not to stop too much, although you can certainly pause to look at birds, uh, because you want to cover the entire transect in a set uh, period of time. Now, just like with point counts, how there is variable radius and fixed radius, you can do the same things along this transect. Uh, most commonly, though, you'll have some sort of fi fixed radius, uh, so you're basically going to be identifying all the birds that fall within a strip of land, right? Hence the name strip transect. Just like with point counts, we do need to be concerned with standardization. In this case, we have to standardize the length of the transect, the width of the transect, and of course the time it takes us to do this transect. So this takes a little bit of practice because you want to make sure that your walking pace is such that you're going to cover the standard length in the given observation time. Now, the advantages to this sort of transect is you can cover a lot more ground, you can see a lot more of the habitat, and it's a little bit easier, particularly for those who uh, need to do visual observations, to get to different vantage points where you can see birds. There are challenges here in that your distance to birds crossing the transect will vary, so in some cases you might have to identify birds even farther off because they're going over your transect, but you're on the opposite side, you know, you're just beginning, it's towards the end, so it's a little harder for you to identify those birds. There's another variation on the walking uh, survey, though, called the area search. Um, and Similar to the, the line transect, you do walk around, but in this case, rather than having a fixed line that you walk along, now you have a fixed survey area. Uh, this is nice because within this search area, you can move however you need to to properly survey the area uh, and see whatever birds happen to be in your search area. Uh, this is probably the easiest of the, the main types of surveys for beginners to master because again, you can go wherever you need to to get visual identification, um, and you spend obviously a set amount of time searching this area. The main challenge with the area search is this takes a bit more work ahead of time because you have to now positively identify the boundaries of your search area. Uh, so one common thing that's often done is before the you, know, you start searching a given area is you use flags or markers to mark the boundaries. Uh, that way you can visually detect what falls within your search area, and what is outside. Now, again, standardization is important. In this case, you want to standardize the area that you're covering. So if you're using a rectangular search area, you know, you have standard lengths and widths. If you're using some other shape, you need a way to standardize the area that you're searching. And then, of course, you'll have a fixed amount of time to survey this area. Now, for both the line transect and area searches, these tend to be a little longer, whereas point counts are often 5 to 10 minutes. Area searches and line transects, you often take 15 to 20 minutes uh, to survey your, your transect or your area. Um, so again, you get a little more breadth and coverage than you would with a typical point count. With both line transects and area searches, you're going to be moving through the habitat slowly, making your observations and recording your data as you go. With line transects, you'll be following the transect line. Often that's a trail, and some other feature that allows you to move through the habitat unidirectionally. 
uh, and you take your time to make sure that you cover the allotted distance in the fixed amount of time. Again, with area searches, you're free to move through the habitat, whether that's on trails or off, to wherever you need to be to be able to make those observations. In that case, being very cognizant and aware of where the boundaries of your search areas are. survey you may do are coastal surveys of offshore birds. Uh, if you're doing a coastal survey, typically you're going to be looking for seabirds flying in or over the water, so you want to be able to have a good view of what's on the water. So when you do this, obviously good optics are very important. Uh, having binoculars or spotting scope is often really important, especially for IDing birds that might be far offshore. It's also important to have a good vantage point. You generally want to find a place where you can see the water clearly. It's best if you can do so near the water to find some place that's up elevated, so maybe a coastal bluff, so you can look down on the water and actually see the birds better. You also want to be sure that you're able to see the entire area that you're surveying. So you want to make sure you've got a clear view of the entire coast. Seabirds can be tough to spot, so you definitely want to have a good telescope mounted on a sturdy tripod. You also want to make sure that when you're doing uh, any sorts of surveys that you have your instrument for recording your species handy, whether that be an app on your phone or data sheets on a clipboard. Uh, so have all those ready before you begin the survey. Similar to a point count survey, you're going to want to make sure that you have a well-defined area that you're searching. You also want to have some sort of device where you can record your time. After setting up, again, you'll want to take a pause before you start surveying so birds can return to their normal behavior uh, and get accustomed to you. Once you're ready to survey, uh, generally coastal surveys will be very visual. So you'll be using binoculars and telescopes a lot, uh, and a lot of the observations you'll be seeing will be out on the horizon, out on the water, or in many cases, bird flyovers. And again, similar to terrestrial surveys, you'll want to regularly record your scene on whatever instrument you're using to record data. Uh, and again, carefully monitor your time so that you know how long you've been conducting your surveys. With coastal surveys, you'll also want to be sure that you're recording what's going on on the beach in front of you, and then spend some time using your telescope or binoculars to scan the horizon. A lot of times birds will disappear between the waves uh, and you have to look carefully to see them. 